Coming up on Digital Music Trends 179 on the 16th of April 2014, the Gramophone, Deezer's new features and Samsung partnership, Spotify's partnership with Sprint, Smule's new round, Universal Music buys Eagle Rock, Pono's 6.2 million Kickstarter, Kim.com's new lawsuits and Asset Win, P2P in Spain, and a chat with Deborah Newman on the latest developments in the rate court proceedings for internet radio services in the US. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available on a variety of channels including uh, iTunes uh, and most podcasting apps including Downcast, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out uh, with a lowdown on the latest shows, you can sign up uh, right from the homepage or go to uh, bit.ly slash DMT list. So again, it's a bit.ly slash DMT list. And if you want to comment on something we talked about on the show, you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com. Your feedback and word of mouth is essential to making sure the show goes out uh, to as many people as possible. So please do share it if you enjoyed it this week. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome two great guests to the show. So Andy Maltus, editor of Complete Music Update or CMU, which produces some great weekly uh, features and daily features on the music industry. So hi, Andy, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, thanks for having me back. It's great to have you. And so, and uh, of course, uh, I, I can't have you on without mentioning the uh, CMU Daily, which is your daily newsletter, which is free to sign up to. Yeah. And uh, that's on the, uh, the website, which is uh, completemusicupdate.com. And also you have a premium subscription now, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the premium subscription, the daily, the daily uh, newsletter goes out and there's uh, a kind of a, a massive daily roundup of everything that's happened in the last 24 hours uh, the 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 premium subscription is kind of a more of a digest like a weekly focus on what the big uh developing stories and things are company and then we also have a monthly kind of really in-depth report that goes out to people who sign up for that awesome and uh, it's also a great, a great pleasure to welcome back steve knopper on the show steve writes for rolling stone is the author of the music industry book appetite for self-destruction uh, which uh, if you haven't read that you need to go and buy on amazon uh, right now and is currently writing the ultimate michael jackson biography so hi steve and thanks for joining me how's it going Good. Thanks, Andrea, for having me. Always nice to be back here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And so uh, this week we're going to uh, open up actually by talking about a hardware project on Kickstarter. And no, it is not uh, the Pono. Uh, we're going to talk about the Pono, but not quite yet later on in the show. And so uh, the, uh, the Kickstarter project is raising $250,000 to fun fund the Gramophone. So the Gramophone is a new hardware project uh, led by the founder of the Fon Wireless Routers company, Martin Varsavsky. So Fon has created a network of 13 million wireless routers around the world which act both as Wi-Fi hotspots for the per people that have it in their, in their home and also as a means to share your internet with the, the world. So in turn, if you do have this device and share your internet, then you can use uh, uh, phone hotspots around the world which is pretty handy if you're traveling. So the Gramophone is kind of an extension of that device uh, and it's uh, uh, completely focused on music. It's a small square box that can be connected to your existing network uh, and then connects to your sound system via a good old-fashioned lead allowing uh, uh, people that come to your house uh, to share your internet connection and but also share uh, into your music uh, playing uh, um, opportunities so they can play music through your device and of course you yourself uh, through the application on your phone can play music uh, through the device on your speakers the cool thing about it is that it's wi-fi uh, driven and it pulls music directly from the cloud so there's no issues with the uh, bluetooth connections or uh, issues with the connection between your phone and the device uh, uh, disrupting the music listening experience like calls or messages or anything like that so uh, the, the devices start at $30 for the very very early early backers and then and now it's, it's I think it's around 50 for the remaining time it's uh, raised around $80,000 right now so it's doing pretty well a second you know less than 48 hours uh, out of out of out of the uh, bag on Kickstarter uh, 28 days to go and so it looks like it will hit the target unless things are slowed down dramatically and uh, so guys uh, uh, let me know your thoughts you know it's an interesting play it's uh, really uh, one of the first things that uh, seems to challenge the Sonos in the sense that it's a device that does something similar but doesn't uh, have the speakers so it's just the device itself and it's a very low low price point so what, what are your thoughts and Andy uh, yeah I think it's great because I mean I, I look at Sonos kind of every couple of months and think yeah I can't really justify paying money for that I'd, like yeah. I live in quite a small flat I don't need all my rooms connected up um, 
but this, like, you know, I, I looked at it on Kickstarter and I wasn't really sure if I needed it, but it's so cheap. Oh, I, might, I might as well have one, really. Exactly. Um, you know, it's like it only works with Spotify at the, moment, obviously, at the moment. Obviously, it's only got kind of, it's not got the functionality that, that Sonos does. But uh, as a, a, a little device that you just connect to your hi fi, and, you know, I've got quite an old hi fi, so that, yeah, that's quite exactly. good for me. Yeah. Um, and and the fact do. that you know, your, friend, your friends can connect to it, your friends can connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, your friends can connect to it, and your friends can connect to your Wi Fi through it without you having to find the bit of paper with your password written on it. Uh, it seems like a really kind of useful thing. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, you know, if you are a music lover, you, probably at some point in your life you have bought a pair of, like, half-decent speakers, but now it seems like, you know, there's no device with which you can play music through those speakers and you have to go and buy a whole new set of, of speakers, which is not, it's not the greatest thing in the world. But, uh, uh, Steve, on your end, are, are, you, are you convinced by the gramophone? Do you think it's a project that has got some legs? I, I do. I mean, I think that the model is really interesting, but I'm, I'm having trouble seeing how it differs from the system that I'm currently using in my house, which is right. just basically my iPhone and the remote app and, um, you know, a couple of Air, Apple AirTalk Expresses. You know, yeah. I, I basically plug those in to the, to the outlet and, and connect them to my Wi-Fi and plug them into my speakers. And, and using AirPlay, I can, I can get Spotify and I can stream my entire, you know, iTunes collection and so forth. I realize I'm being very Apple-centric here, but... Sure, of course. Um, you know, I, that works great for me. Uh, I find that all I need is two or three different pairs of speakers. And um, like Andy, I have considered going Sonos for, for a while, but can't really justify the expense. So right. this this method is, is much cheaper. And, and um, the, the whole gramophone model um, seems interesting to me. And, and I especially am interested in, in sort of their, the, their unique approach to Wi-Fi networks. But yeah. I can't really quite see it being practical enough that I would pay to to upgrade from what I have currently, which yeah, I like. Sure. Exactly, and and you know, yeah. you, you got the. Sorry, I was going to say. Yeah, like, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I have a similar thing at the moment. Like, like, obviously, it's only Spotify, and at the moment, I can I plug. I pretty much do the same thing, I guess. I plug my phone in, and then I can control what's happening on my phone on Spotify with the app on my iPad. So I'm not, you know, it's not. A massive change to how what I'm doing at the moment, but it's inter it was interesting enough and cheap enough that I thought, well, I'd quite like to see that and see yeah. how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I actually I, I pledged for it uh, for the I paid for uh, I was uh, in uh, in on it early, and so I got I got the thirty dollar device, which is really yeah. uh, you know it's nothing. So it's yeah. uh, it's it's, uh, it's definitely worth uh, to worth it to check it out. And uh, I guess like the one thing uh, the the cool thing about it, and it could be also quite creepy, depends on on like how people take it, is the fact that your friends that come to your house, if they are your Facebook friends, they are automatically allowed onto the Wi-Fi network without having to give them a password or anything, and they're also automatically allowed to play music. Music on your device, so that could be a good thing or a terrible thing, depending <laughs> on <laughs> how good your friends' music. Does is. that mean that uh, if you have a party, does that mean if you have a party, everybody's fighting for the music and the music is constantly changing? Like, no, the two seconds of this, no, two seconds of that. <laughs> that could be the case. I don't know what kind of controls uh, they're putting into place. I think I think they do have a control where you just you just uh, kick everybody out and just say, no, I'm, I'm sorting out the music uh, for now, uh, if you get to that stage. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something that uh, I'm sure they're going to have to build into the platform. And, uh, and yeah, no, it's, it, it, it seems pretty cool. It's definitely a, a, a weird entry because, you know, it's, it's a company that hasn't been in the music space ever before, but it's, uh, uh, it is definitely very grounded in the Wi-Fi space. And uh, if I get this device and I can also uh, access a, a bunch of hotspots uh, uh, around, uh, around the world, that's not bad. I mean, even here uh, in, in my house, I can see there's a BT with phone uh, Wi-Fi network that I can see from here. Uh, they must have some sort of partnership with BT, so it's definitely something that could be uh, pretty cool if, if it is uh, uh, available internationally. Of course, that's also a way for them to break the US market because they haven't really uh, done a lot in the US yet, so if they can get a, a bunch of people to buy the device in the US, then that would definitely increase the chances of their network spreading over there as well. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. We've still got 28 days to go, but it looks pretty good right now. Usually if a project hits like, sort of the 20-25% the in the first couple of days, it's a, a a very good chance that it's going to get funded so uh, we'll see what happens on, on that front um, and uh, uh, one more story um, uh, that is uh, actually has nothing to do with this so I can't even do a segue I'm, I'm trying to I'm <laughs> trying really hard uh, but uh, I want to talk about Deezer so Deezer uh, sent like a, 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 a huge press release last week it was uh, it was like three pages long uh, uh, with a bunch of different announcements so we're going to have to tackle them one by one and just uh, uh, talk about, about them in a, uh, you know breaking them up a little bit so uh, first of all the company's introduced two new features 
features. Uh, the first one is called Flow, and it creates a personalized radio uh, station based on the user's streams on Deezer and on their own music library. So uh, you can do six, six skips an hour, and it's free from any time restriction and available to all Deezer users, uh, free and premium. So that's an interesting development. The second feature is another radio uh, one, and it's called Playlist Radio, which is going to be, uh, be available only to free users and will be ad supported. And it will include tracks from users' favorite playlists uh, combined with tracks recommended by Deezer's editorial team. Uh, so first of all, a radio play here. And uh, uh, the second big announcement was the fact that Deezer is removing all time limits on desktops and, uh, desktops and tablets for on-demand access around the world for the free version. So that's uh, that's really interesting because, of course, uh, Deezer is a company with the most uh, presence uh, uh, worldwide as far as streaming services are concerned. Uh, and finally, Deezer is unifying users' music collections with a new beta for uh, uh, the Mac client, on, on uh, the Deezer Mac client. So it's going to be a bit like Spotify. You can have your own collection on the client as well as Deezer's collection. So... Uh, Let's look at the global footprint of Deezer, first of all. Do you think that the fact that they are removing all these restrictions and that the service is going to be freely available around the world uh, uh, for users that are not paying as well is going to allow them to get a foothold in markets where Spotify, for example, is not present yet? And, and how much can that contribute to the company's success, uh, Steve? I guess, let me start by asking you kind of a dumb question. Is, is Deezer now available in the U.S.? Or, or is, is that... Not, it's not yet. They, they, it's not. Okay, they so, keep saying so, that they're planning uh, to launch there. Sorry, that, right. That so being long American, long. it's it, right, right. It's it's hard for me to answer because I've never used Deezer before, and exactly. and so you know my my thoughts are are really very American centric. I'm afraid, and and um you know the the idea of a Deezer launching here, um it seems like they would have a ton of competition already with Spotify and Beats and iTunes Radio and and Pandora, and these new features that you're describing um, are interesting, but it's kind of like they're establishing themselves elsewhere. Right. To kind of make up for things that are already available here. So so I'm not, I, you know, globally, I think they have a great niche and a great business market, and I think they'll do fine. In the U.S., I think it'll be a struggle unless they can really distance themselves or distinguish themselves from the others in some way. Absolutely. And Andy, like, that, that kind of brings us to the question, like, these features really look like, a lot like what Spotify has been producing over the yeah. last months. Yeah, right? they, see, they seem more like just catching up rather than... Than, than kind of doing something really new and exciting. But I think, I mean, with Deezer, like Deezer made, I mean, talking about the US, Deezer made a big deal of not launching in the US a couple of years ago and saying, that, like, even then, I mean, that was about 2012, I think, maybe 2011 even, um, saying that, you know, the market was saturated and there was too much competition and there was no point trying to enter the US. And now they see there's been kind of talk of them, well, interesting talk of them partnering, partnering with Samsung to get into the US at some point this year, which yeah. possibly is what... Uh, the, the Galaxy partnership is about really, um, but I don't. I like. I know. I, I, I never get excited about Deezer. I find it really hard to get excited about Deezer. It's kind of. I know they claim to be the original kind of streaming service as we currently know them, and and they claim to have huge numbers of users. But I mean, they also are the, the service that's done a huge number of telecoms deals. So you never really right. know how many of those users are people who have got a free account with their mobile contract and have no idea that it's there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. These is just these is these really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting. Like uh, I've I signed up uh, uh, once again after ha haven't, I hadn't used this, the service for a long time. And it does seem like to have a lot of focus on curation. I received uh, mm. uh, a fair amount of emails already from the company around uh, sort of uh, things they were suggesting for me to listen to and things that I might like. And, and they seem to be pretty good recommendations. So on that front, I, I think it's a, it's a positive feedback on the experience so far. Uh, but uh, I'm just so used to all the features on Spotify now that it's hard to kind of uh, make make the shift uh, properly uh, but uh, you know the, uh, talking about the Samsung partnership that's that's a super interesting thing because Samsung is uh, it's kind of been really uh, shifted you know, shifting strategy all the time when it comes to its digital music uh, properties. And uh, uh, in the US, it launched Milk, uh, which is based on Slacker's technology, uh, Slacker Radio, uh, which is a you know free radio station for Samsung uh, customers, essentially, uh, uh, based on, on music. It's a kind of a Pandora-like uh, station. Uh, and uh, Milk, though, I guess, wouldn't be available in Europe because of licensing restrictions. Uh, Slacker is not available in Europe, and it would be a massive headache for them to export the service here. So maybe that's 
where the diesel partnership comes in. So that the partnership means that um, people that are going to buy a smartphone from uh, Samsung over the next, uh, you know, a few months or, you know, uh, as long as the partnership goes on for, they're going to get six months worth of uh, premium plus uh, uh, diesel service, uh, which includes high quality streaming up to 320 kilobytes per second. And it will be, uh, it will start with a promotion of the Gal Galaxy S5. So uh, interesting to see here whether it's going to remain just a European thing or whether it's going to expand or not. And also another interesting thing is the fact that we haven't really seen a, a, a device maker uh, including music as their own service uh, since the debacle of uh, Nokia's comes with music. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, St uh, Steve, do, do you feel like uh, uh, there is still space here for uh, device makers to uh, successfully introduce uh, uh, their customers to new services? Or is that era dead and gone and, you know, carriers are what it's all about? Well, this particular service, as, as I'm reading about it, um, Milk seems to be very Pandora-like. And, right. and right? It, so, so my feeling is that just on that level alone, not to deal with your broader question, um, I mean, it would, it, especially if people are paying for it, it, it would have to be something that is a value add above Pandora. Right. Milk, milk is always going to be free, and I think ad-free as well, possibly. I'm oh, sure. I see. Okay, so so that's good. But still, I mean, I feel like Pandora is pretty well established, especially in the U.S. And and I feel like if and people are very loyal to Pandora too. Yeah. Um, so I think that if you're going to come in and kind of do more or less the same thing that Pandora does, you especially if you're if you're it, as part of a device, you know, if you're exclusive to one particular device. You really have to add some things, yeah. um, and and just the service being great, you know, I don't think that's enough. I think you're going to have to say we have a new Jay Z album or we have a Beyonce album, you know, something that you can't get from Pandora. Yeah, if those sorts of things start to happen, which is sort of what I thought would happen with Nokia's comes with music a few years ago because they had all those connections and a lot of money and clout. Um, if those things start to happen, I think that you could really have something, but. I don't know, with Deezer's track record, um, you know, like Andy was saying, yeah, it's Deezer, you know, are they really going to do exciting, <laughs> sexy things? You know, I, I don't I don't see that happening, but yeah. um, but never say never. I mean, sure. uh, services surprise me all the time. Uh, Andy, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the European launch of the Galaxy S5 with Deezer built in. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I guess the, the 100%, uh, it all comes down to how this is implemented, because if you just put like a s slip in a box with you know, saying mm. you get free Deezer for six months, that's not really going to drive people to really use it. Uh, they, must be do, they must do something more in terms of awareness in, in order for people to really catch on to the fact that they're getting free music with this phone. So what could that look like for you? Yeah, well, I, don't, I mean, I guess like with, with Spotify, with, um, with the, their Vodafone hookup, uh, you know, you, you have to opt into it. And it's like you get a choice between you know, Spotify and Sky Sports. And that like is very much a, a, an active thing. Whereas I think... A lot of these telecoms partnerships, with not just Deezer, but I mean, Deezer's obviously been a big one in doing these kind of partnerships. It's, it is a passive thing, and you, you know, pe most people aren't going to even realise that they've got this thing. But yeah. you know, Deezer are still saying we've got all these users. Um, I think it's interesting, possibly like if if the Samsung thing was was related to a US launch. Uh, I mean, the, there's not a lot of good mobile networks to to, to partner with in yeah. the US. They've kind of been hoovered so maybe going down a hardware uh, partnership is it does make sense if the, if if that's the route they're going to go down yeah yeah sure. um but like you say like you know the, the whatever they do there's there's a lot of competition uh so you know i don't know it's, it's uh, it, i it was, we just say this every year but i think you know we're getting to a point now where it's it's getting very interesting and and i think we're going to start seeing more more people dropping out of, yeah. of the game because because it is getting very competitive and very tight. Yeah. And uh, uh, another thing. Getting bought. Sorry? Getting bought. Or yeah. getting bought. More, more or getting bought. Yeah. Well, this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be interesting also because, uh, you know, a move like uh, uh, Deezer is to offer free music, uh, unlimited. Uh, in 180 countries, that's a very expensive move. Uh, reg regardless of the fact that they haven't launched in the US, it's still going to cost them a lot of money in royalties. So uh, definitely interesting to see how how that increases their their burn and you know their need to raise another round uh, in the, in the long term as well. Um, and uh, Steve, uh, uh, talking about carrier partnerships, uh, like Andy was saying, you know, uh, the, the the space in the U.S. is kind of becoming much more restricted now. Uh, Spotify uh, has been uh, reported uh, by Peter Kafka, uh, Peter Kafka Recode, which is uh, 
always very who is always very reliable so I, I trust his sources uh, he reports that Spotify has closed the deal with Sprint to bundle uh, the music streaming services with a mobile carriers plan so Sprint has got over 50 million uh, customers in the US the th it's the third uh, uh, carrier by size after AT&T and Verizon AT&T of course has gone with Beats Music Verizon hasn't really I don't think made a choice yet it, it feels like on their website they, they push Rhapsody more than anything else but uh, that, that might be like still a, a bit of a question mark when it comes to, uh, to partnerships so what do you reckon is going to happen in the US market uh, and do, do you think that carriers are going to be open to having multiple streaming partners or will it, is this it is you know Beats Music going to be with AT&T exclusively and uh, Spotify going to be with uh, Sprint exclusively well, I guess I, my, my best way of answering that would be from the consumer perspective. I, yeah. my, my family has three phones, one's AT&T and two are Verizon. And so we've had, I've had one Spotify account for, for many years now. Um, and, you know, and my, the, my other two people in my family are frustrated with that because yeah. they can't get it on their phones, you know. So, so we were excited about Beats because at first we thought, okay, well, we'll just pay 15 bucks a month instead of three separate $10 subscriptions and get the family plan. But then it turns out that it's not available on there for Verizon phones, and then you still have to pay 10 and then 10 and then 10. It's just, it's too confusing, and it's, it seems too expensive. Right. Although it's, it's a little perverse to say 30 bucks a month for all the music in the world is expensive. But nonetheless, <laughs> that's sort of the, the, the rate, that, the going rate right now. But so I'd, I guess to answer your question in, in a more simplified way, it's just got to play out. It's just yeah. got to shake out in terms of all these different phone services hooking up with a particular music app, streaming music app, to, to make it simple and to make it relatively cheap for the user. Yeah. I mean, I would do that. If, if I could pay $15 for either Beats or Spotify, or even $20 a month, probably, uh, that seems like a, a bit of a stretch for, for wider consumer adoption. But if, if I could pay that amount um, and get that app, that, that service on each of my family's three phones, I would do it in a second. Yeah. Um, and that would make my daughter and my wife really, really happy. And we could all be happy listening to music all the time together, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's not what's happening now. This this seems a little bit like, remember those pre iTunes downloading days when it was sort of like, well, yeah. this guy's going to do it this way. And if you happen to have this, then this will do it this way until it's all congealed into like, oh, OK, iTunes does everything for everybody. Yeah. You know, that it, it feels like we're leading up to something and this is still a little bit sort of the Wild West, if you will. Yeah, we, we talked about the partnership between Spotify and, and The Times, for example, a few weeks ago that gives mm -hmm. uh, free access to subscribers of The Times in the UK uh, to Spotify. So do you, do you think uh, we're just uh, seeing the beginnings of uh, a bunch of different media deals that are going... In, uh, I do, I do. I mean, I think that streaming mm -hmm. music is, is something that um, is incredibly valuable. And, and these, these services that have the deals for the content have a, are sitting on you know kind of a gold mine although you know they obviously have to pay a lot for the content yeah. but but it's valuable to a lot not only not only media outlets but mobile carriers and there, I can see you know Ticketmaster I can see all kinds of bundling opportunities here um, and I think that's what we're headed towards yeah. I think it's sort of like you know go to Target and get a month free of, of Spotify you know or whatever it is you know just thing get a buy a Ford car. And, and get Spotify as part of your radio, you know, all these things, they're all coming together. And I think eventually, probably soon, um, the power of streaming is really going to start to come out and it's going to seem much less like a niche the way it is now. Yeah. Andy, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And, and do you think that yeah. uh, it's going to uh, continue in the UK as well? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, I think partly these partnerships, I mean, they make sense for the streaming services because they, they get a different audience. Like, you know, the, the right. Times deal... That was like you know a, a year was it a year free with your your subscription? Yeah, that's like right. it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a long subscription, and that you know and and part of the problem with all these services is that for a lot of people you know a week or a month isn't long enough to to really get into that service, and, and particularly now that like the people who who have not signed up to those services are people who are going to be harder to to get. Yeah, and if you get someone to use that for a year, and then at the end of the year say actually now you've got to give us ten quid. A month, you know, that, that's long enough for them to kind of understand what it is and get get all their playlists set up and get ingrained into and, and really hook them in. And then the, similarly, like the family deals, um, you know, if you can hook an entire family in, you know, their kids are going to grow up and go and get accounts for their families. It'll be like, you know, 
spawning new users all over. <laughs> um, yeah, I think those those deals definitely make sense for uh, for for the streaming services. And uh, in in terms of the the people they do the deals with, it it it, it well, I guess it depends on whether it, it kind of brings in new users and makes their their current you know customers feel like they're getting something yeah. of of value on top of what they you know they already have with their accounts yeah sure absolutely and uh, one of the areas that I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how it develops is the, is the cable slash uh, uh, sort of uh, TV operators I mean TV operators in the UK and cable operators in the US we haven't really seen a great deal of partnerships going on in, on, on that front uh, uh, I don't think Sky has got an official streaming partner here in the UK uh, unless I'm mistaken. Um, I don't think so. And likewise, Comcast, I don't think they have a, a service they are pushing, right? Steve? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't I'm know. Not sure either, a music yeah. service on Comcast? Uh, sorry? Are you saying a, like a music streaming service yeah, available exactly, via yeah. Comcast? I don't believe there is one. I don't one, believe but there I is one, that. yeah. So that, that could be like a huge pool of users, potential mainstream users that those companies could, could uh, hook if they could find a way to do the deals with the, with the big uh, uh, yeah. cable providers. But then, yeah. then again, cable providers already have their own problems. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Sky is still, uh, they're still you know, a bit sad about what happened to Sky songs. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're still in the morning period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give it time. <laughs> yeah, as as long as they can get up their the black clothes, then it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so uh, that, that's going to be a one to watch for sure. And uh, uh, the other the other uh, interesting story of this week uh, was the uh, fundraise of Smule. So Smule uh, is a company that's kind of like still under the radar in a sense. Like you know, we're not really talking about Smule all the time, but it is one of the f like, probably the only company that's really managed to uh, create a big business out of uh, music apps uh, they've got 150 million users across all of uh, their apps uh, the company is famous for magic piano uh, auto rap uh, imt pain and sync karaoke amongst uh, other apps uh, you know the, their users are creating a, a ton of content all the time they're creating their own communities uh, they started you know their uh, uh, their own uh, sort of smule nation channel to try and aggregate those communities together which were sort of uh, um, uh, broken up in, in different uh, parts of the internet, including Facebook as groups. Uh, and so they raised uh, another $16.6 .6 million uh, with uh, uh, a Roth Capital, uh, Bessemer Venture Partners, Granite Ventures, and uh, Shasta Ventures. And uh, potentially eyeing an IPO. Uh, the capitalization is now $42 million. And so lots of interesting stuff happening as Mule. I actually want to get an interview with them at some point soon to, to work out what's going on there. So, uh, you know, what's your take on uh, uh, music app and music? music games and uh, uh, how come Smule has managed to break uh, uh, you know break this uh, formula of doing this while well, so many companies have uh, failed and I know that personally because I work for one so um, <laughs> <laughs> Andy what are your thoughts? Um, well you know they're, they're not a company I know a huge amount about but I, I know you know apps like T-Pain and, and Auto Rap and things like that um, like uh, I'm, they're things that I'm kind of vaguely aware of existing and, and always seem like something that would have a really short shelf life, like something that would be entertaining for maybe an afternoon at most, yeah. may, maybe into a second day, but, you know, <laughs> not long. But then, yeah, obviously then they're, they're saying they're building these, these you know, this like kind of online community around people who are making music and collaborating on things. So maybe, maybe there is something there and maybe, you know, you only need... You don't need to to kind of hook in everyone in the world if you can just get all the people who are kind of interested in in doing that on a daily basis. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there is a business there. Maybe there is a business there. And uh, and uh, <laughs> Stephen, I was at a a meetup the last uh, the other week at a company called Rolly who were doing a really cool uh, new product called the Seaboard. Uh, so it's a new music keyboard. And so uh, it's, it was all about sort of interact, music interaction and uh, lots of people that are doing PhDs and, and interesting research around that. And, and uh, uh, there was somebody there that was talking about the fact that they see the next age of music as being more around the creation of content and uh, sort of a de democratization of, of uh, the, the generative music space. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, Smule have managed to steer away from uh, being completely tied to licensing deals. Uh, a lot of the stuff that they have is, is generated by the audience. Do you think that's a trend that we can see continuing? And having uh, uh, kids yourself, do, do you think that they, they might be interested in this kind of thing? 
Yeah, I mean, my I think it's all a function of how good the apps are. Right. You know, it, it's and I, I I agree with Andy. I mean, I was kind of shocked to see that sixteen point six million dollars. That seems like a lot to me for for a music app on a, on a phone. Um, but these are cool apps. You know, the 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 um, sing karaoke and and various things. I can see them. Um, I have a twelve year old daughter. She hasn't used any of these in particular. I don't think. But she's constantly downloading apps and and doing things, and she's super interested in music. So if there's one that catches her, yeah, she I could see she's on Instagram and 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 you know all the all the uh, all the different Snapchat, all the different social networks, and so she's constantly doing these things. I could see this being a big deal, but I, I do think that Andy's point about this being a, a going concern in the future is very relevant. I mean, yeah. Think about you know Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Five years ago, we thought that was the future of the music business. Like, look at this amazing <laughs> new revenue stream. You know, we won't have to sell albums anymore. We'll just put our songs into into Guitar Hero. And now, now where have they disappeared to? I mean, even I am T Pain, which is a bit of the of the Smule, um franchise app to an extent. You know, T Pain has already left and come back since that app has come out. I mean, T-Pain used to be a gigantic star. I just did a story on him. He, he used to be a, you know, the biggest star in, in R&B and, and pop and hip hop. And then he went away for a while and now he's kind of making a comeback. So, you yeah. know, I just think that a lot of these apps are, are here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and, and so it's going to depend on Smule's continuing ability to keep coming up with a cooler and better and more popular app to kind of regenerate and replace the next one. Will they do that? You know, obviously time will tell. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, moving on to a uh, slightly less uh, less fun uh, subject, uh, <laughs> uh, there, there was an interesting move from Universal Music as the major label announced uh, the acquisition of Eagle Rock Entertainment, a company specializing in the release of uh, DVD concert videos and documentaries by mostly classic artists, including the Rolling Stones, uh, Pink Floyd and The Who. So Eagle Rock operates also two record labels, uh, Eagle Records and Armory Records. So the Financial Times reported, uh, uh, mostly on this, uh, they reported that Lucian Grange, uh, chief executive of Universal, said that expanding our audiovisual catalog and production expertise is critical as the company looks for other ways to exploit music-based content. So uh, Eagle Rock's uh, library contains uh, nearly 2,000 hours of programming and more than 800 titles. And um, uh, there's a big crossover between the artists that are, have released uh, uh, videos via Eagle Rock and uh, Universal Music Administer Catalog. So that's definitely a bonus in terms of the, 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 the crossover. And, uh, uh, you know, Eagle Rock hadn't really done a lot on the, on the online video space and it looks like a good opportunity for them to tie up with the uh, already uh, very well developed Universal Music uh, you know, online video teams and uh, figure out what to do with this content online and how to monetize it. So it, this seems to be like an interesting development because we were talking last week about uh, Vivendi's uh, sale of SFR and all the money they have and the fact that you know, Universal might start branching out into new uh, avenues or trying to develop uh, segments where it's not as strong uh, a little bit more. So uh, what do you make of the acquisition? And do you think it was weird because Eagle Rock is such a sort of uh, old school company still, and <laughs> but it does have a ton of cool content? So, uh, Andy, uh, yeah, I think it was in the, they they are quite an old school company. I think that's yeah right to say. Um, but they, yeah, they, they they make a lot of good a lot of good films. Like yeah, that Rolling Stones film was really really good. Um, uh, yeah, it's an interesting acquisition, um, and and certainly it seemed to be one that, as well as catalog, it seemed to be one that they were you know doing for expertise as well. Yeah, because um, I mean Universal has its own in-house TV production division, as far as I know. Um, and yeah, uh, so yeah, it, it it was a, I guess it was a bit of a surprise, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Interesting. <laughs> definitely very interesting. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, of course, we don't know the, the the figures as well. So it could be a figure that wasn't that high for Universal to pay to to get a hold of all that content. Yeah, as well. I, mean, I mean, interestingly, they took they did take the the two labels that the company owns, but not the publishing company. Yeah, um, which is now it's like spun out as its own standalone thing. Yeah, no, it's very good. You pointed that out as well. So, yeah, it's uh, it was a uh, another sort of uh, kink in the deal. And uh, as, as Steve, uh, uh, on, on your side, do you think that we're going to see labels try to get more expertise on uh, the long form video side of things, where you know they've, they they they're, they're pretty good now, of course, at, at doing short uh, video clips, but they haven't got a huge amount of expertise on how to produce and market long form content, and and that might be a good source of revenue for them, right? 
Absolutely. I mean, I, I, this is a gamble, I think. Again, like Andy said, you know, depending on how much they spent on the company on Eagle Rock, but it, it's a gamble, <laughs> but I think it's a smart one. And we could look back in five or 10 years at this deal and say, wow, they were really shrewd, you know, the way they, Universal partnered with Vivo and launched yeah. Vivo. Um, I mean, video content is really interesting right now. I mean, 10 years ago, I would have said this was a bad idea because, you know, YouTube's just playing everything for free. And, and, you know, there, there's no way anyone can make money off YouTube right now. And it seemed like there was this dormant period among content providers of, you know, what are we going to do with, with our music videos? What are we going to do with all this documentaries and behind the scenes content that we have and stuff? But, you know, in recent years, of course, YouTube has turned out to be through ads and, yeah. and through, you know, their content ID and all the various things that they do has become a pretty potent um, revenue generator for, for content companies and, and record labels in particular. So I could see, you know, taking, I mean, I've, 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 like you guys, I've seen some of the content on Eagle Rock and it's very good music content. Um, and I could see them taking their, you know, their Nirvana documentary and slicing it up, either, either releasing it as, as a full thing on, on Netflix and trying to monetize it that way or, or slicing it up and saying, you know, here, YouTube Nirvana community, you know, that's, that's more popular now that we've had the, the 20th anniversary of Kurt Cobain's passing, you know, yeah. this is this is hot content and exclusive content that no one's seen. So why don't you watch these snippets of this, you know, Dave Grohl interview or whatever, you know, and, and it gets a few million hits on YouTube and or Vivo and, and you know, everything's synergized and, and, you know, you get some money from ads. Yeah. So if you, I can't see any individual play from this being a, a giant, like, save the record industry thing. But it seems like if you collect a, a bunch of those little things, um, you know, it could be some significant revenue eventually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I was just going to say it's interesting that I mean, there is they, like Vivo has started putting up some more kind of longer form stuff. Like there, there was the the Nine Inch Nails uh, show that they put up. Uh, it was the end of last year. Um, so it's certainly something that is uh, not you know inconceivable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. And uh, uh, it's, I guess it's time to talk about Pono. Uh, we kind of have to because, uh, you know, <laughs> we talked about it a lot on the show in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, it is a very interesting new development in the industry because nobody would have bet on it doing as well as it did. Uh, the Kickstarter campaign came to an end last night uh, and uh, the Neil Young-backed project shattered its 800k uh, objective and raised $6.2 million in 30 days. The project had uh, 18,220 backers and according to what I calculated, which I, I hope is correct, it sold uh, 15,148 devices uh, with the other backers just buying t-shirts or, or sign posters or uh, stuff like that, which was uh, cheaper, of course, than the device itself. Uh, that's like, that was way above even my, you know, my own projections. I, I said on the show before that you know, 10,000 was the most I could see the, the, the unit selling, but it sold way more than that. So uh, that's awesome. And uh, of course, it's all down to the delivery of the product now and the delivery of a digital ecosystem that is going to be able to support that product and deliver high resolution files in, in, in a fairly, you know, uh, decent catalog, you know, a, a large amount of tracks. And so well, what are your thoughts uh, having the campaign concluded now? You know, we're not going to hear much about it until the product actually comes out to the market. But, uh, you know, has, has it changed your mind around the product, seeing the excitement around it? Do you feel like, uh, you know, uh, 15,100 people is enough? devices out there to create an ecosystem around the, this new digital service and and uh, yeah just a bit of a roundup really uh, steve so so basically i mean i i think that um i think that this is a great thing for audiophiles right. audiophiles have a lot of money they will like the ecosystem of of pano assuming it's relatively easy to use and it, it's it's somewhat as easy to use as your ipod or your iphone or whatever it is yeah um whether it goes mass you know to to people who are already happy with the devices that they already listen to music on i don't necessarily think the mass public of music listeners really cares that much about audio quality you know that that's the big money that's the big play yeah but i don't think it's going to happen and i don't think neil really cares whether it happens either yeah, no, I don't think he does. Uh, Andy, what are your thoughts? Did you did you buy one? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know I didn't. Uh, I I think Pono is just the most stupid thing <laughs> in the world. <laughs> okay, uh, like. The, the, like they talked about in the in the when it came up to like forty eight hours to to go on the campaign and they put out a statement saying or an update on the you know to the backers saying this is starting a revolution in high quality music and it's not it's like 
the, the high quality digital music players have existed for a long time and flack music files have existed for a long time and all Pono is doing is selling a really expensive player that you can't even put in your pocket and then getting you to buy really expensive flack files which you know which you could you know you have about four on your player and it's just like I don't understand why anyone would spend any money on it at all, especially when like it looks so old-fashioned and it's downloads. And you've got like Wimp in Norway who are doing like WAV audio streaming, like that seems like the area to go in, like high-quality streaming. Yeah. Why? It, like this, this just seems kind of it seems like a very 2007 thing to do. Yeah, there's my soundbite for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's again. It sold six point two million dollars. So, so there's some, well, I mean, maybe it's new coke. You know, I, I don't know. But. I real yeah, I realize that you know I'm 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 shouting at something that's just made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but no, I kind of I think it's like, a huge debacle. I agree, but but I don't know. They're audiophiles. They're 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 always looking for something. They're they're ready to spend their money as long as they can get you know just this much little bit of sound quality that that they perceive as being better. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's it as well. Like, if you're walking around, you've got to, you're going to have to have very good headphones yeah. to notice any kind of, yeah. you know, increased level of sound quality as you walk around the park or whatever yeah. with the thing in your hand because you can't put it in your pocket. And it, yeah, I, I don't understand. And I kind of I wonder how much of you know the people buying it was like trying to buy into something, trying to like kind of it's almost like giving money to Neil Young rather than like actually buying into you know some high, high quality music. Yeah, revolution. I think like an interesting thing to look at actually. Let me just uh, pull it up uh, uh, real quick. Uh, was the uh, the fact that there were all these uh, uh, devices that were linked to uh, a particular uh, artist? So there were uh, I think five hundred uh, devices each for uh, the uh, for each of the artists and there, were, there was a long list actually of artists that uh, you know put their signature up uh, for uh, these devices to be signed by them essentially uh, in uh, uh, you know in, in the metal so for example you got uh, people like uh, sorry Patti Smith uh, and Buffalo Springfield uh, Emily Harris uh, Pearl Jam Grateful Dead Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, uh, Jackson Brown uh, Neil Young Arcade Fire uh, you know, back, uh, uh, you know, a, a bunch of artists. And, and that was interesting to see how many devices uh, those sold as well. I mean, of course, it kind of came down to demographics in a sense, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, some artists completely sold out of their, of their 500 devices and some artists didn't sell that many. Uh, uh, but it, even the demographic side of things doesn't really make sense, because, for example, a band like Foo Fighters, which would have had a much younger demographic than uh, Neil Young himself, uh, they only had eight devices left out of the 500. Uh, and so, you know, it must mean that a lot of Foo Fighter fans actually went out and bought the device. So, I don't know, I'm kind of confused as to what makes sense of, or how to make sense of this, but I just wanted to sort of point out there were, you know, thousands of, of devices sold off the back of these sort of signed uh, 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 special uh, 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 limited edition things. Uh, which, which but maybe, maybe what's going on here, you know, I'm, I'm speculating too, because like you guys, I'm kind of confused about the appeal of this, but, but maybe what's going on is the same reason that you, as a Nine Inch Nails fan, will buy an expensive $200 box set um, when you can just get all the music for free or very cheaply yeah. um, somewhere mm -hmm. else. You know, it's like you want a thing. You want to buy, here I have a Tom Petty signed, cool looking pyramid shaped device that <laughs> Neil Young himself has endorsed that I can put on my desk. And, you know, I personally wouldn't want that. I can't afford it. But, you know, there are people who probably it's like a high end gizmo gadget that will, yeah. <laughs> you know, add to their the, the decor of their home or their personal fashion in some way. You know, I don't know. I, I think that there's, something about a physical something or other that people still like and maybe are even desperate for in this time when there aren't that many things like that in, in yeah. the music world. I don't absolutely. know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was interesting today. There was some uh, some research that came out today ahead of Record Store Day where uh, they found that kind of like 26% 20, of young, like I think it was 18 to 24 possibly or 25 to 34. It was, it was the younger demographic of record buyers were buying... Uh, music with no intention of ever playing it. They just wanted a yeah. thing. To they own. just want a thing. Sure. Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was talking about ecosystems. So 15,000 people, uh, if, you know, these are people that are willing to spend, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a year in music, then, you know, if it becomes, you know, six, seven, ten million dollar a year business uh, in terms of music transactions, that would be definitely a sustainable business if those people only spend, you know, 50 or a hundred dollars a year on, on uh, Pono's, uh, you know, music store uh, files, then that becomes a little bit more difficult to make the math uh, sort of uh, come together. So we're going to literally have to wait and see when everything launches and when the devices are shipped uh, how uh, everything comes together and uh, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about uh, Kim.com so Kim.com uh, there's been a bunch of news this week around him uh, which was interesting and uh, Steve uh, I know that you wrote a piece as well on on uh, uh, Rolling Stone uh, just uh, yesterday I think uh, uh, it got posted uh, around the story so first of all the first news was that uh, the MPAA and the RIAA uh, posted new lawsuits uh, against Kim.com during last week, uh, the MPAA earlier in the week and the RIAA followed uh, a, a little bit later. Uh, this is uh, eyeing up the assets that Kim.com had uh, um, that, that were seized uh, essentially, the mega upload uh, assets that were frozen. And so of course, if uh, these companies were to uh, get awarded a part of uh, those frozen assets, of course, that would be a pretty good payout for them. Uh, uh, you know, he's uh, uh, accused of a bunch of different things from, uh, of course, copyright infringement to also money laundering and a, a bunch of other different uh, charges. Uh, uh, and so that's the one side of the story. So, uh, uh, Steve, on, on your end, why do you think that the, the labels are keeping at it and, and are really uh, not relenting on this fight? I mean, the basic reason, you know, I talked to a few, the, the RIA didn't want to talk for the story I wrote, and of course, Kim.com didn't talk either. But so the, the experts that I talked to basically said, the labels just think they can get money. Yeah. They, you know, they think that there's a way to get money out of this, and or at least it's worth trying to get money. I mean, you know, I, I, I think I sort of mentioned this in my piece, but right now, the, aside from the money that the labels, you know, perceive him to have infringed and the money that he's gotten away with through copyright infringement, um, he is sort of like a blessing to content companies right now because here's this guy with a giant face who is just out there going, you know, I'm the villain, I'm the bad guy. It's like what the, what the labels wished LimeWire and Kazaa would have been or, you know, Napster 10 or 15 years ago. Like, okay, fine, we're just, it's like, a, it's this giant pinata and they're going to, okay, we'll take the baseball bat and we'll just take a few whacks at it, you know, and, and, um, and hopefully some money will come out. Yeah. And so so it's great the the record industry. I mean this this ship has really sailed I think the you know uh, the the record industry and and to an extent the movie industry have even moved beyond illegal downloading to an extent. I mean yeah. they're already onto these new models where it's almost not even as relevant as it used to be. And I know I'm kind of maybe jumping the gun on that a little bit. But so if, if you can if you can say hey here's here's the villain I'm going to attack the villain you know that that's always good. Although, and, like, and so uh, I think it's a win-win for 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 these content companies. Although, I would argue that, uh, uh, it, strangely, uh, as as much as you know. Uh, there are a lot of shady things that have happened around mega upload uh, over time. Uh, uh, Kim.com has kind of become like this really likable character. So, Andy, do you think that can be a backlash of this whole uh, sort of demonization of him? Is the fact that he actually turned out to be a really open and talkative guy that actually a lot of people end up uh, liking after they talk to, to him? Uh, yeah, I definitely think he's become kind of the cuddly face of uh, file sharing. Yeah, <laughs> he, you know, he, like he's got a lot of fans. If you follow, you know, follow him on Twitter. He's got a lot of people yeah. who who you know think he's absolutely in the right and, and follow everything he does. And now he's launched his own political party. Yeah, I mean, admittedly, like he's doing all this stuff in New Zealand, so kind of there's not a lot of people there to vote for him. Sure. But uh, but it, 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 it is interesting how he has become this kind of fun. I mean, he was a funny figure anyway, but he's a kind of a this fun figure. Um, in, in terms of the lawsuit, I think obviously the MPAA just gave up waiting for his extradition yeah. and just kind of have gone like, you know, this criminal case may never, ever happen. Let's just get our civil case out of the way. Yeah. And then I think the record labels have gone, oh, well, if they're doing it, we'll have a go as well. Yeah. Might as well. Yeah, exactly. We might as well get some money and not be left out in the cold if the MPA does get a ruling in its yeah, favor. Yeah. So, uh, and, so, and, and the other story about Kim.com was the fact that uh, it was a big story, actually. Today, a high court in Auckland, New Zealand, de de denied uh, the Crown's application for an extension of the freezing order on uh, Kim.com's New Zealand assets. Uh, so he's got millions of dollars as well as cars and a bunch of assets in New Zealand. And uh, it, it seemed like the, the, the court couldn't find really grounds to extend uh, uh, this uh, 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 you know, freezing of his assets beyond the two years uh, that they've already been frozen for uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, 
you know, there's still grounds for appeal, I think, at the moment. But if uh, uh, the ruling stands in two weeks, Kim.com could get his assets back. And he immediately tweeted, you know, uh, the, the asset ruling is huge. We've just filed a case in Hong Kong against the unlawful seizure of Mega Upload. Uh, the US case is falling apart. And also he said, you know, our assets were seized for 800 days and I was still able to fight back even with my hands tied uh, behind my back. Imagine what I can do now. So that's definitely a big statement here saying, you know, if I get my money back and I can actually hire a ton of lawyers to, to look after uh, my, my cases, then it's going to become really difficult for uh, the prosecution in, in uh, both uh, New Zealand, the US and in Hong Kong to actually carry on with the case. Uh, you know, what, what do you make of it? And, and uh, <laughs> uh, on your end, uh, you know, can you see ever him being extradited to, uh, to the United States, Steve? I don't know. I, I, I'm not as enamored of, of Kim as a, as a cuddly public figure, I guess. I, I, um, I mean, I, you know, I think it's funny. I think his story is, is interesting. But, um, you know, I do think in the end he, he pretty clearly and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a record label shill or anything like sure. that. I, I think that they've done a lot of stupid things over the years. But, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that this guy profited off of, you know, illegal copyright infringement, which which is something I think was a pretty obvious case of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that this judgment um, in in uh, in New Zealand was um, was a huge victory. Uh, I, I, there, there's still an appeal left to go, you know, I'm, I, and and it's just it's just basically has to do with getting some of his fortune back. You right. know, I, I don't. I think that his declarations of victory and and I'm the cuddly face of file sharing and stuff like that. I think that's he's just riding it as long as he can, you know, and, and eventually it's going to come to an end. I think, um, I, I just, I see him as being somebody who is making a lot of hay out of this stuff. But in the end, you know, if you look at the things that he's accused of doing and many of the things that he's kind of admitted to doing, you know, I don't think it's good. I think that, that most people will eventually kind of realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Mandy, do you think that, uh, this, uh, you know, this will, Put a, put a brakes in, in, you know, in the cases that are going on around the world if he gets a lot of money to actually hire you know, an army of lawyers at this point? Uh, I, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I agree. Like, obviously, you know, he's become this figure, of, uh, this kind of you know, fun figure b because that's how he's presenting himself. Yeah. Um, and and as, you know, as much as you know, on a daily basis, him and his lawyer are putting out statements, every time anything happens in any of the many cases against him, you know, his, him and his lawyer come out and say, well, they, this just proves that the case against us is completely groundless and it's going to fail. I mean, and that is, you know, the, the, it's not got to court. This, you know, it, it's just it's just talk at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it's not like they're kind of presenting huge amounts of evidence to the country. They're just saying, you know, we're going to win. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and he, he doesn't, he, if he hires 10 more lawyers, they're just going to say, well, we're going to win. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not going to make much sense. You know, the, the movie industry has a lot of money as well. So yeah, it, sure. It, it's, it's kind of, he's, he's still got something tough to go up against, if yeah. he, you know, if and when he gets extradited. Yeah. And I wanted to, to finish, uh, uh, well, not to finish, but the last story we're, we're going to comment on was just uh, uh, talking briefly about uh, Pablo Soto. So, uh, and he, he was the creator of uh, uh, the software uh, Blobster and uh, uh, Piolet and Manolito, which were P2P software uh, uh, that were very popular uh, sort of in the uh, late 2000s uh, uh, in Spain, but also around the world. Uh, uh, Soto got uh, sued in 2008 by Universal, Sony, EMI and Warner uh, uh, and uh, Promusique, which is the Spanish RIAA and uh, uh, because essentially you know they, they, they said he was facilitating uh, uh, copyright infringement and uh, uh, of course uh, that uh, wasn't good uh, I actually met him in 2008 I think uh, in, in Berlin uh, just as the lawsuit was uh, filed and uh, now uh, several years later uh, in Sp Spain actually has uh, reiterated what seemed to be kind of the country's stance on this uh, which is the fact that uh, his activities were uh, not only neutral but perfectly legal uh, and uh, were protected by Article 38 of the Spanish Constitution. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, clears Soto of any wrongdoing, and uh, Soto didn't make uh, anywhere near as much money as uh, uh, Kim.com from his activities, so his was definitely a much tougher fight uh, from, from, uh, from a legal uh, perspective when it comes to funding it. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, he is going to release more software now that this is, has, has, been, has been said. Uh, but there is you know, an ongoing problem in Spain uh, of illegal, uh, you know, of copyright infringement, because it seems like uh, the vast majority of content that is exchanged in Spain it is illegally copied or, or, or transmitted via P2P networks of some, some sort or another. So, uh, so it's kind of hard here. You know, it was uh, kind of the 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 big 
majors against the one developer, but at the same time, you know, there is a, an ongoing problem of piracy in Spain at the moment. So what do you guys make of it? And, and uh, how do you think we, we could get out of this funk uh, uh, in Spain, but also in, in other countries where it seems like P2P is essentially legalized? Anybody wants to take this as the last one? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's an interesting... It, it's just, I think it, 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 any legal case in Spain it, related to file sharing is interesting because it's, it, everything kind of plays out so differently there to, it ha to how it has in the rest of Europe. Yeah. Like, you know, there was the, the research recently that said uh, since 2001, revenues, you know, music revenues in, in Spain, record revenues, have dropped by 80% because, you know, file sharing is so... Continues to be so prevalent, in, and and uh, but yeah, they they passed uh, a law in two thousand and seven to to allow web blocking like we've had over here. And obviously, you know, we've always said <coughs> web blocking isn't particularly uh, effective, and and I think that's that's proved to be the case in Spain. You know, file sharing is as popular as ever. But then for a court to say, well, you know, there's there's nothing illegal about this. Yeah. Uh, it makes it a lot harder to fight. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, uh, Steve, on, on your front, you know, how do you feel about this? You know, again, it was a case of a bit of a perception play here for the music industry, uh, you know, filing a lawsuit against a relatively small uh, company and developer here. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you feel is going to come of this? Uh, and do you feel like Spain is a country that can be rescued when it comes to, to uh, uh, getting people to pay for content when they've been so used to, to exchanging via P2P networks for, for a long time? I mean, I don't know them. I don't know as much as Andy does about about um, Spain and its feelings towards file, illegal file sharing and and copyright and so forth. But it certainly does seem like an anomaly. I mean, yeah. the, this is this is sort of the only significant court decision that that since Napster really um, that that's come to this conclusion that that uh, a P two P network, um, you know, is it isn't responsible for the illegal activities of its users. You know, certainly that was something that the the U S courts dealt with all the way up to the Supreme Court um, and, and in great detail when they were dealing with companies like Grokster and Napster and, and LimeWire and so forth. Yeah. Um, the one interesting side note, maybe Andrea, you remember more about this than I do, but I remember this coming up in my book research. Um, Mr. Soto uh, had some discussions with the major labels for a while. Um, it, he, he met with some uh, executives at Sony and they were interested in sort of potentially licensing his, his, uh, his software, his Napster-like software after they'd sort of realized that they missed the boat on the original Napster. I remember right. that coming into play. And of course, this was 2003 or something, so, you know, it never went anywhere. But uh, but I, I, I remember this character. I remember him being interesting. As I, so I, go, I, didn't know, I, went, I didn't know I went as far back as 2003, actually. Um, I, I, I missed that. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing that from memory. But, yeah. um, but to your question, I mean, you know, I'm not sure what how this affects. Um, it, it seems like Spain perhaps is a bit of a lost cause for content providers. Um, you know, they, they, I mean, certainly if their if their top court is saying you know this sort of a service is is okay, you know, something that contradicts all the decisions, all the precedents in the U.S. and and most of Europe and and elsewhere, um, you know, maybe maybe there's not a lot you can do about it. You yeah, know, I, maybe you just have to wait for things to change, if ever, if you're if you're a content company. I guess uh, it, it really comes down to how the software makers themselves decide to position uh, their service. You know, I think if they, if somebody like Soto said, you know, I'm going to release a new version of Blobster, for example, and I'm going to try and behave a little bit more like uh, BitTorrent in trying to work with artists and providing ways for artists to monetize against the content they're distributing on P2P networks and making that ecosystem a little bit more monetizable and a little bit more interesting on the, on the commercial front. Uh, that could be something that's, that's good, I guess, if, if P2P is already so established. But if it keeps being a question of exchanging files freely without there being any sort of uh, way to tie that in back into the industry and helping our artists, then it becomes a little bit of a harder argument to make, I think. Yeah. I we'll agree. see what happens with that. And so, uh, finally, uh, a couple of months back, we had a brief chat about the latest rate court decisions in the U.S., but none of us was particularly well informed about this. Uh, so I called up Deborah Newman, the founder of Music Strat, who's uh, very well versed in these matters, to explain what's happening in the U.S. Uh, so here's my chat with her for anybody who is uh, interested in an overview of what's going on in the States in terms of uh, internet radio payments, both, both on the master and on the publishing side. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure today to have uh, Deborah Newman uh, joining me on the show. Uh, Deborah is the founder of Music Strat, a strategic consulting company focused on the intersection of music, technology, and the law. So hi, Deborah, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? 
Oh, it's going great. Thank you, Andrea. Nice to be here. So it's a real pleasure to have you today. And uh, uh, I, I wanted to have you on the show, on the main show, because uh, essentially every time we come up to the uh, issues around rate courts and the news surrounding that, we have a really hard time uh, debating it amongst ourselves because many of us don't actually know uh, exactly what we're talking about. Even if I've been covering this space for, for quite some time, it's still hard to get the words lined up in the correct way so that I don't uh, say things that are totally inaccurate. So uh, definitely uh, great to have you on. Thanks much for for joining me nice to be here that's great i think your uh, interviews are really excellent and i'm pleased to be able to finally do this with you that's great thank you and so uh, essentially i wanted to talk about uh, first of all uh, the most recent development which was the uh, ruling in the uh, uh, rate court ascap case uh, which came up uh, uh, just after actually i'd recorded all my interviews of south by southwest which is a bit of a shame because it meant that that didn't really enter in the conversation but uh, uh, it means that we can talk about it now so uh, the rate court uh, oh, so first of well, uh, give us a little bit of a background around the music strat so that we understand where you're coming from when, you, when you're giving your thoughts on, on these matters. So music strat is my consulting company. Right. I, um, as you probably know, I've spent uh, my entire career in the music business, not always as a lawyer. I'm actually more of a recent uh, lawyer. I spent 20 years at CBS Records, which became Sony Music along the way. And that was more on the creative side in the music video area. That's really where I sort of made my name. And then I left Sony in uh, early 94 and got involved in the very early days of the digital and online music business in the 90s. Went through the dot-com boom and bust in the 90s. And uh, in 2001, decided that the action, I was the head of marketing in those right. days, right. but there was so much going on in the area of rights and licensing as new kinds of services, digital distribution was happening. And I could see that those battles were the gating factor of what was going to happen success-wise with some of these companies. And I decided to go back to school and get my law degree and focus specifically on copyright, entertainment and what at the time they were calling cyber law which is really internet law and communications law and so I went to law school from 2002 to 2005 and finally passed the bar and in 2008 sort of started my consultant practice and mostly I work on the side of the startups on the digital music services yep. and helping them understand copyright, understand um, the sort of uh, ecosystem of the music business and the rights that are implicated by what they're doing and then help them get the licenses they need uh, in order to operate or to launch a service that they're doing. So I work a lot with, with really with startups. Awesome. And so, uh, so to pick up on what I was talking about, uh, so the uh, ruling in the ASCAP uh, uh, case uh, in, in the rate courts, of course, uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about that and then we can move on to talking about the disparity between master uh, royalties and publishing royalties and also talk about the uh, Songwriters uh, Equity Act that has just been introduced. And so, uh, first of all, talking about this, uh, what are your thoughts on the ruling? Uh, for people that haven't uh, listened to a previous show where we did, did cover this uh, uh, in, in a little bit anyway, uh, ASCAP uh, uh, will receive uh, 1.85% uh, of uh, Pandora's annual revenue. Uh, this is uh, a lot lower than ASCAP was uh, hoping and uh, just a little bit higher than what Pandora was hoping. So uh, from your point of view, or where does this leave us uh, in terms of uh, how the space is going to move? Well, first of all, this ruling only applies to the period of 2011 to 2015. So right. we have a year and a half of, of, under this rate. And what it sort of did was save Pandora retroactively from having to pay more because what they wanted was a scaled up rate up to 3% for the prior years, 2011. So Pandora, you know, won in that case. Um, the main argument, one of the arguments that was going on, which was where Pandora wanted to be, although it may have just been a negotiating ploy, was to be at the same rate that terrestrial radio pays for songwriters. Right. So under the Radio Music Licensing Committee, RMLC, that negotiated rate was 1.7%. And a big point that uh, Ken Steinthal, Pandora's, I went to the opening argument, so that was kind of fun to be there um, on a blizzard day one day, uh, <laughs> argued was that um, there was a quirk in the law that allows terrestrial radio companies who own 
internet radio services to pay the same rate for internet radio services that they do for their broadcast radio stations. Right. And specifically, Clear Channel, which is the largest owner of terrestrial radio in the, in the United States, owns, I don't know, 1,800 stations or something like that, also operates iHeartRadio, which is a direct competitor to Pandora in the same space, well-funded, and they pay 1.7%. And so that was really one of Pandora's main arguments. So why should they be paying more than iHeartRadio? Um, the court saw that uh, and um, you know appreciated that and looked at the definition of under the consent decree of what are, quote, similarly situated uh, uh, stations or similarly situated businesses and found that they were not because of a number of sort of complex factors exactly similarly situated and did not give Pandora that lower rate. But they... Uh, definitely, I mean, it was sort of a compromise, and in that sense, Pandora won, but you could say that ASCAP at least had something to say that they won because the rate didn't get pushed down, it only stayed the same. Yeah. But what's going to happen going forward is a, is a complete unknown, because these rates are going to end up being changed again. The standards by which the rates are set is a big issue in terms of the factors that are looked at. And uh, Pandora won, as did all the internet radio services that operate under that uh, ASCAP rate of 1.85% for the moment. But it's a complete um, you know, unknown as to what's going to happen next. Yeah, sure. And uh, so um, uh, this is just one of the, the two main trials that were going on uh, in this space. Uh, there's the BMI one is actually a few months behind or at least a couple of months behind uh, as far as timing is concerned. So that ruling could be expected sometimes this summer, you think? Well, the BMI, uh, uh, this, this particular uh, case with BMI probably won't actually go to trial um, until the end of the year. Right. And there probably won't be a decision on BMI until next year. Okay. Um, so, you know, and we're talking uh, 2015 already. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to go look and see if the time frame for the BMI rate period is the same as ASCAP's, if it matches that 2011 to 2015. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. But the arguments are basically the same. And BMI's rate um, is, is, well, Pandora has been paying less than the published rate that BMI has in their non-interactive uh, performance uh, uh, licenses are is actually higher right now than ASCAP's rate. Yeah. And so the, the key issue now that I guess that I see is the fact that on the one side, you know, we're kind of stuck when it comes to publishing to these uh, uh, very minor rates, uh, which have prompted, uh, uh, you know, lots of songwriters to uh, cry foul around how the system has been established. We saw a tweet by uh, Beth Midler even uh, last week uh, talking about the royalties that she received received uh, uh, for her tracks that were pl been played millions of times on the service uh, and, uh, and so, so we're, uh, what we're trying to figure out here is the balance between the, the, the master recording and, and the songwriters. The Songwriter Equity Act is one of the um, most uh, sort of uh, interesting uh, things that we've seen uh, come up in the last few months uh, uh, which does try to uh, give a little bit of a better slice of the pie to the songwriters. So uh, what does the Songwriter Equity Act do? Uh, are you pro or against? And also, you know, what can be done to increase the publisher's percentage, which is l really low, uh, without really making the services pay anymore? Because that's a key question mark, right? You know, the services are already paying through the nose and struggling to be profitable with the rates they're paying right now. So, of course, we don't want to jack up all of the rates, but uh, I think songwriters probably deserve a little bit more than what they're getting right now. Well, you're actually right. I mean, first of all, there are two different uh, publishing rates at issue here. One is the uh, what's called Section 114, which is what a Pandora operates under, which is the uh, streaming performance, streaming licensing. And then there's the mechanical rate, which is Section 115, right. which um, determines the uh, publishing rate for on-demand services as well as for the sale of CDs and uh, and for the CDs per song rate. So that rate, like Spotify, for example or uh, RDO or Rhapsody or any of the on-demand services pays also a statutory rate for publishing. It's different from the Pandora rate. The Songwriters Equity Act um, is an attempt to change the standard by which the rates are determined from what's called a um, 
it's, it's a little complicated, the 801B, which is an analysis of a number of factors, the 801B standard, to a willing buyer, willing seller standard, which allows marketplace deals that are done, like deals that have been done in the past between Sony and Pandora or EMI and various services, to be used in the setting of the rates and those rates have been higher so it's a tug of war uh in, in terms of the rate um the, the standard by which the rates are set what is the big issue is as you said the services themselves are desperately trying to blossom and grow and remain profitable profitable so to these new if the rates for publishing get uh, raised does it come out of the sound recording rates does that rate get lowered um you know who's the one who pays it does the service end up paying it do the record companies the sound recordings owners have to give a little bit for the publishers to get more that is completely unclear right now and i think that you know from the stamp my perspective since i represent the digital music services most of whom are not in the pandora Profit, you know, well, Pandora's not profitable either, oh, exactly. but that's money yet. And for them, these rates are onerous if they're just starting. They're, they're startups, they're bootstrapped, they're raising money from friends and family, and these rates can be very, very uh, onerous to them. So, and I think that the court recognizes that this is still a new business that has not evolved and is not yet um, profitable. And so that's where the tension lies, and nobody's going to want to give, and I think we see a battle coming up. Yeah. One of the things that's also happening is the Copyright uh, Royalty Board, CRB, which is the entity uh, that sets the rates for Pandora for streaming services that are collected, administered and collected by Sound Exchange, that is going to start very soon. So the right. new sound recording rates are also going to be uh, up you know, for grabs. So it's all sort of happening in a you know, in the same time frame where the battle over the split on these rates. I mean, um, there is uh, some evidence to say that the sound recording royalties are in some cases as much as five times the publishing royalties. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's out of whack. So who pays more and who who gets cut and who pays more and that we don't know that yet yeah and i i think there's also there's a, a couple of different things that also i wanted to lo look at one of them is the sort of the politics around sound exchange as well so uh, in your experience is sound exchange does it behave as an independent body is it is it closely tied to the uh, record labels which re which receive a share of uh, of uh, you know what's paid by the, by the services uh, uh, how does sound exchange behave when it comes to these negotiations could it be open to uh, a slight lowering of the rates if it means that the publishers are going to get more or is it completely uh, you know in a standoff position and we're not going to allow the rates to be lowered well sound exchange was created by the record industry to yeah. collect minister and collect the rates that were granted under the digital performance and sound recording act when the first rights were granted to be able to allow the owners of the sound recordings to monetize the sound recordings in digital uh, radio. And as you know, terrestrial radio does not pay anything yeah. for the use of the sound recording. That also is in now up in the discussion because the whole area of, of co I know I'm digressing for a second, but the sure. whole area sure. of copyright reform or modernization is on the table. And because of this disparity, um, a lot of things that people are now looking at, and it's serious. I mean, for years, this has been uh, attempted to be passed, and the radio industry, National Association of Broadcasters, NAB, has been very powerful lobby and has been able to prevent it from being passed. Now, with new copyright legislation, there is a good, a better chance that terrestrial radio will have to pay something. Yeah. So first of all, if that's the case, if terrestrial radio pays something, I believe that the pressure to raise the rates for digital will be somewhat relieved if the performers and record companies are actually getting some money from an area they've never had before. That's yeah. one thing. Sound Exchange doesn't set rates. Sound Exchange represents the labels and certainly has a lobbying power, very strong, but they basically administer and collect the monies that are set by the CRB. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 
it's it's sort of the it, what's really interesting it's the battle between the publishing industry and the record industry and in many cases the large publishing companies are owned by the large record industry so yeah. to some degree it's an internal battle between divisions uh, at at major labels, which is, I think, sort of bizarre. Yeah. But it also comes down to who, which contributors to the music we listen to are the ones that make that are going to make the most money. Is it going to be the performer, or is it going to be the songwriter? Yeah. Uh, uh, one last thing that I wanted to, to uh, ask you about was the fact that there is a fundamental difference between the, the distribution of, of uh, money uh, between uh, the money that gets given to the uh, master uh, side and the publishing side when it comes to this internet radio services. Because if we look at Sound Exchange, we know that X amount uh, goes uh, directly to the artist and X amount goes to the label which is a kind of a, a, a very different take on, on how royalties are usually paid. They're usually paid to the label and then they pay a percentage of that to the artist. Whilst for, on the publishing side, that doesn't happen. So on the publishing side, the, the royalties get paid to ASCAP or BMI. They go into that big black box and then they get paid to the uh, publisher and then they have to trickle down to the songwriter. Uh, do you think that's, uh, that's a major problem when it comes to songwriters actually getting paid from these services? And uh, are we going to see songwriters trying to uh, you know, get a, a bit of a clearer idea of how many plays they've had and, and really understand a little bit more about how much money they're getting and why they're getting it? Well, first of all, songwriters uh, who administer their own publishing and who don't uh, grant those rights to a third-party publisher do get paid directly from the okay. performing rights organization. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, of course. Not always that they give it to the publishers, but the publishers traditionally uh, sign songwriters and have a split uh, between what they collect between them and the songwriters and uh, take an administration fee because there's a lot of other things that publishers sure. uh, do do. So, um, you know, that, uh, that that model is not unlike the record company that, that gives an advance to an artist and goes through the process of making the record and selling it and yep. marketing it and whatever. Um, I don't know if that uh, payments directly to the songwriters is going to evolve like the way sound exchange pays performers directly that's a good that's a good question um it's certainly pop, uh, performers are getting money if they sign up to sound exchange which a lot of them don't even know that they could so sound exchange sits on a lot of money that's not given away because they don't know where to send it yeah. but that's actually a great asset for songwriters um what i think will be even more interesting is if and when terrestrial terrestrial radio pays a royalty will it be structured like the sound exchange digital royalty who will actually collect it how will it be distributed you know that's another whole piece of that puzzle yeah and there's gonna um, be a big battle around that i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure because there are going to be um a lot of people vying for harry fox you know a lot of people vying for being in that business the issue of data and transparency is a big one and um I think some of the services are trying very hard to create a more transparent back end for rights holders, including songwriters, to be able to go in and see their plays, um, uh, you know, their the usage of their of their music, of their rights. Right. Um, it's still very complicated because, especially on the publishing side, the rights information uh, is very complex. And as you know, in, in many cases, you can have four, five, six, many, many songwriters on one song, and um, there's no no one central database where anybody can actually go and see what uh, who the writers are. Yeah. And this is a problem that is being talked about a lot. It hasn't been fixed yet. But all of these organizations have their own databases and they're matching the sound recording to the songwriters. And, um, you know, you would like to think that everybody gets paid on a what's called a census basis for the actual use of their music on a purse per song per play but it doesn't quite work like that there are exactly. formulas the performing rights organizations use to pay and you know i don't understand the formulas well enough because they're all different yeah. but at some point we have to get to a point where it is transparent and where usage is paid based on actual usage and not on some formula based on some relative in other media uh usage or, or however it's it, it's done right now which yeah. is very unclear because nobody will reveal. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, Deborah, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, and uh, I'll definitely have you back on uh, one. Uh, and if, uh, well, I'm sure news will come up in this field, it's, uh, it's uh, bound uh, to come up. So, uh, well, thanks so much again for coming on the show. That's great, Andrea, and I'm sure I'll see you at some 
convention again soon in the future. Absolutely. And uh, you can find uh, all the information about Music Strat on musicstrat.com. Is that, is that correct? And uh, Deborah's handle, in case you're not uh, watching the video version, is uh, at Deb Newman on Twitter. Thanks so and much. And that's all for this week. Hey, guys, it was a real pleasure having you on. And so I want to I hear about what you're working on. And Stevie, you, t you said that you uh, just wrote a great piece for uh, the New York Times magazine, right? I did. It's my first piece ever for the New York Times. It's about um, Sia Furler, the the pop singer who uh, who now writes songs for David Guetta and Christina Aguilera and Beyonce and so forth. And um, I'm excited. I've never been in the New York Times before, so so this is a this is kind of a thrill for me. It, it's supposed to come out Sunday, and uh, we'll see what the reaction is. Yeah, she made like a, a proper comeback, right, in the last three or four years. Well, her thing is that she she was a singer herself, and she yeah. was getting more more popular, you know, five, six, seven years ago, and then all of a sudden she kind of abruptly changed her um, her uh, uh, idiom and she decided that she would be a songwriter for other people. Um, so she sort of does it in reverse. She, like, I, I was on track to being a pop star and now I've just decided that I'm going to go behind the scenes and, you know, make a lot of money but not be famous. And so that it became sort of the the gist of the story, the yeah. socially phobic pop star. It's not, it's not a bad thing to do, actually. You know, you still make money and you don't have to tour. And uh, so that's, that's not a bad thing. That's exactly, <laughs> that's, that's her, that's her thing. And she's, it's working. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, Andy on, on your front, uh, anything you want to plug, uh, of course, the great escapes coming up and you guys are working on that. Yeah. I have to mention the great escape. Uh, uh that uh, is when are we we're very very close to it now so it's, that's the 8th to the 10th of may in yeah. brighton uh we're just kind of right now putting the last touches on the the conference that uh we uh we program every year yeah. um we've kind of we've we've rejigged it a bit this year it's going to be different it's kind of be <clears throat> going to be six six strands uh focusing on diff different topics in the music industry um, so everything, uh, there'll be kind of interviews and discussions and uh, presentations and things all in each, you know, in, in grouped into, into each strand. Uh, and we've also got a couple of mini conferences. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, the uh, DIY conference that we did last year. It's kind of aimed at um, new musicians trying to get into the music industry and uh, like delegates at the Great Escape get access to that, but you can buy standalone tickets as well. Uh, and then this year we're launching a, a mini tech conference uh, called Blueprint, which uh, is kind of looking at, at, at stuff I guess would be of interest to, uh, to uh, uh, digital music trends listeners and viewers. Awesome. Um, uh, the big, the, the kind of the, the exciting thing uh, we're doing in that uh, is that we just announced is um, who sampled are doing uh, a sample thon, which they're describing as like a, a, a hack day for musicians, and they've cleared this huge catalog of uh, samples for people to right. come in and like over the course of the day just make music. That's very cool, and uh, yeah, definitely going to keep an eye out for that. And uh, uh, we're trying to sort out some sort of uh, recording of DNT at the Great Escape, so hopefully yeah. that's going to happen, and that's going to be awesome. And so uh, look out for that in the week uh, that uh, the festival is happening. If you can't make it down to Brighton, uh, of course uh, we have a lot of listeners in the US as well. And uh, well, it was a real pleasure having you on uh, once again. Thanks so much for coming on, and uh, uh, don't forget to check out the DNT one to one. Well, I'm talking to the listeners now. I guess it's kind of hard to uh, <laughs> explain that, but. Yeah, uh, uh, for the listeners, uh, uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to check out the DMT One to One show again, which comes out every week, uh, interviewing uh, interesting companies working in the space. Uh, last week I had Stage Block, and this week I have an interview with a new social music app called Lucky Penny, which is currently being featured in the App Store on the Music Discovery uh, apps category. Uh, so uh, just go to digitalmusictrends.com and follow the links to the One to One show. Uh, thanks so much for listening once again. Have a fantastic week, and until uh, next time. 